In the annals of world history, there are a handful of prisons whose very names are guaranteed to send a shiver down your spine. Alcatraz is one, Devil's Island is another. But even these can't hold a candle to the most notorious prison of them all. We're talking, of course, about the Tower of London. A vast medieval castle in the heart of the British capital, the Tower of London is infamous for the criminals who were held there. It was within these impenetrable walls that kings and queens met grisly fates, that Guy Fawkes was sent to his doom, that high-ranking Nazi Rudolf Hess was interred at the height of World War II. Yet while the Tower is most famous as a prison, its full history goes beyond merely holding criminals. Over the centuries, the Tower has functioned as everything, from a fortress of domination to a place to mint coins, to a dumping grounds for one king's endless collection of exotic animals. A living relic of the past deep in the heart of the UK capital, this is the story of the legendary Tower of London. On October the 14th, 1066, a single arrow changed the course of British history. At the Battle of Hastings, King Harold of England was felled by an arrow gruesomely penetrating his eyeball, leaving no one to oppose William the Conqueror's rampaging Norman army. Come Christmas that year, the Anglo-Saxon period had ended, and William was on the throne. It was the dawning of a new age for Britain, the establishment of a glorious new dynasty. There was just one problem for the newly crowned William I. His new subjects didn't think his dynasty was all that glorious. In fact, there was a palpable sense that the people of London would sooner boot him up the old backside than bow before him. For William, this was a challenge. Now, yet England, he needed to hold on to it, ideally by a show of force that would stop any rebellion in its tracks. But even a guy nicknamed the Conqueror couldn't just go around hitting every irate merchant with his broadsword. No, William needed something more potent, a symbol that would project his power across the capital, making resistance unthinkable. And it was from this need that the Tower of London was born. Construction on the tower first began in 1075, replacing a wooden fortress William's men had built to pacify the city. Known as the White Tower, the central part was designed to be visible across London, a castle so big that no one would be able to forget who their new masters were. But if you're expecting to hear that William's men immediately began locking people up in the tower, you need to know that it wasn't designed to be a prison. Far from being London's Alcatraz, the tower was more like a kind of medieval death star, a place from where the evil emperor, William I, could oppress England's citizens without having to worry about being killed by the rebel alliance or irate Londoners. And yes, it was also a prison, but we're gonna come back to that in a bit. Over the next few centuries, the London Death Star grew even larger. It was in the 12th century that the outer curtain walls were added, turning the tower into something that we might recognize today. But it wasn't until the 13th century came rumbling into view, by which time William was long dead, that the tower really took its legendary shape. It's also at this point that Tower became a misnomer. Really, the singular Tower of London is actually a whole host of towers, all of which began to spring into existence around the year 1200. First, there was the Bell Tower, from where warning bells could be rung in the event of an invasion. Second came the Wardrobe Tower, where all the king's clothes were held. Finally, in 2020, the Lantern Tower took its place, which lit the way for ships navigating the Thames. The completed tower was a monster, a place where anything or anyone could be safe. At least that was the plan, as it turns out the tower wasn't maybe as invincible as people thought. In its centuries of existence, the Tower of London has had three major roles. The first was that of a prison, which we'll be discussing in detail in the next section. The second was something we alluded to in the introduction, a place where a number of kings locked away their exotic pets. The third was apparently as the place everyone went when they felt like having a revolution. The starting gun on these endless attempts to breach the tower was fired way back in 1189. That was the year of the First Crusade, when Richard the Lionheart went skipping off to start a royal rumble in the Holy Land. Barely had he got the ship to Europe than his brother John was leading a vast army against the tower, hoping to take it and have himself crowned king. He succeeded, but it was a short-lived victory. When Richard returned in 1194, he in turn overran the tower, dragging the sniveling John out at sword point. 
While we'd love to tell you that he chopped John up and paraded his limbs around the city, the reality is that Richard forgave his brother and then obligingly died and made him king just five years later. Still, letting John live did at least lead to an amusing interlude in the tower's history. It was King John who, in 1204, decided to turn it into a home for his lions, leopards, and bears. But more on that in a few minutes. While Richard and John's feud ended with an act of forgiveness, most rebellions centered on the tower came to much more grisly conclusions. Perhaps the most gruesome was during the Peasants' Revolt of 1381. That year, Richard II, a very different dude from Richard the Lionheart, decided to levy a tax on his subjects that would leave them both politically powerless and financially destitute. Bit of a classic King of England move. Am I right, Americans? Anyway, the peasants were all like, nah, not having it, dude. We're not gonna pay that. That's just, no. And then Richard II was all like, uh, yes you are, you peasants. And then the peasants grabbed their pitchforks and they marched on London. Under their leader, Wat Tyler, the peasants forced the king to negotiate. The moment he left the Tower of London to do so, the rebels rushed inside and trashed the place. And when we mean trashed, we really mean it. They ransacked the royal rooms, they jumped up and down on the king's bed, they even dragged the king's mother into a bedroom and demanded kisses from her. But the gruesome bit came when they found the Archbishop of Canterbury cowering in the chapel. Rather than demanding kisses from him, they dragged the poor guy outside and chopped off his head. Because the guy wielding the axe was probably drunk, it took eight blows to do the job. While the peasants' revolt was put down in less than a month, the next major rebellion to involve the tower would last much, much longer. Now, we're assuming you've heard of a little show called Game of Thrones. What you might not have heard of is that George R. R. Martin's bloodthirstiness was based on real history, specifically the 1455 to 1485 Wars of the Roses. And you better believe the tower had a role to play in Game of English Thrones, principally that of a prison for poor Henry VI. A weak and useless king whose weakness and uselessness was what started the wars, Henry was thrown in the tower by Edward IV in 1485. While his predecessor, Henry III, had been saved by retreating into the tower during the Second Baron's War 200 years earlier, Henry VI would have no such luck. In 1471, he was found dead in his cell, almost certainly murdered by Edward IV's men. At the time, it was probably the most shocking incident to take place in the history of the tower. But Edward would not have much time to revel in his cruelty. In a little over a decade, it would be his own children who became the tower's most famous prisoners of all. Back in the year 1100, before the Wars of the Roses, before the Peasants' Revolt, before even the Tower had been completed, a man named Ranulf Flambard made history. The Bishop of Durham he had been a close advisor to William the Conqueror's son, William Rufus, a guy who was super unpopular with just about everyone. When Henry I took the throne in 1100, he decided to make a clean break with the old regime by arresting Rufus's closest advisors. This is how Ranulf Flambard became the first person to ever be imprisoned in the Tower of London. It hadn't been a major success. Exactly one year later, Flambard had again made history by becoming the first person to escape from the tower, kind of suggesting that maybe the tower wasn't all that good as a prison. But still, Flambard's arrest marked the point at which the tower started doubling as a medieval supermax. By the time Henry VI breathed his last in his cell, dozens, if not hundreds, had been held between its walls. But of all those hundreds of people, none would stick in the public imagination like the two princes. After our old friend Edward IV killed Henry, he spent a good decade riding high, convinced that he had this whole War of the Roses thing in the bag. The only problem was that he had his two sons relatively late in his life, and neither was yet old enough to rule if Edward suddenly kicked the bucket. And, well, this is exactly what happened on April the 9th, 1483. The king dropped dead, leaving his son Edward V behind as a mere 12-year-old monarch. Even in the 15th century, letting a 12-year-old call the shots was clearly a bit wacko. So, Edward IV's brother, Richard III, was made Lord Protector, ruling in Edward V's name until he reached maturity. And yes, I know there are already way too many guys called Edward running around in this video. It's a little bit confusing, but blame multiple centuries of unimaginative royals. Anyway, Richard III was meant to protect young Edward V and his brother. Instead, Richard pivoted from Lord Protector to possible Disney villain. Not long after Edward IV Fourth's death, Richard had the two princes placed in the Tower of London for their protection. In reality, it was more for Richard's protection or the protection of his claim to the throne. 
That July 1483, Richard had himself crowned King of England. Not long after, the boys vanished from the tower, never to be seen alive again. It wasn't until nearly 200 years had passed that their bones were found buried in the grounds. Although the murder of the princes has never been definitively solved, the popular explanation, or at least the one Shakespeare gives us in his play Richard III, is that Richard had the boys killed, just as the boy's father had had the useless Henry VI killed. But hey, 15th century history may have been brutal, but at least it had a sense of karma. Not two years later, Richard III was in turn killed, in this case in battle, by Henry VII. With Richard's death, the War of the Roses came to a bloody end. But the use of the Tower of London as a prison, it did not. You see, when Henry VII finally died, his crown passed to his son, also called Henry. And Henry VIII was going to spend his reign imprisoning people in the Tower like it was going out of fashion. If you like your historical figures big, well, they don't come much bigger than Henry VIII. A titanic figure, both in historical terms and in terms of his waistline, Henry VIII was basically the 16th century's attempt to create the most ridiculous monarch it could. He broke Britain from the Catholic Church, established the Church of England, spearheaded the Reformation, and famously did all of this while collecting more wives than I own pairs of trousers. Want to guess now where a whole bunch of those wives ended up? Well, the first wife to get chucked in the tower was Anne Boleyn. Henry had split Britain off from the Catholic Church, specifically so that he could divorce his first wife and marry Anne, which sounds kind of romantic until you hear what happened next. Three years after the pair married in 1536, Henry and his right-hand man Thomas Cromwell engineered Anne's downfall so Henry could marry his latest squeeze. They accused her of treason of adultery and of having sex with her own brother. They then carted Anne, her brother, and four of her closest male friends off to the Tower of London. That May, Anne was forced to watch as her brother and friends were beheaded before being dragged out into the tower scaffold and decapitated herself. But English history still had its wicked sense of karma. Not four years later, Thomas Cromwell was also arrested for treason and dragged off to the tower to be executed. Supposedly, he spent his last night on earth in the same apartments that Anne had stayed in before her execution. We wonder if he spared a thought for the woman whose death he had helped to engineer. But the decapitation party at the tower, it didn't end there. Two years after Cromwell's death, Henry was by now on to wife number five. Catherine Howard was Anne Boleyn's cousin, although it's likely she barely remembered her. Catherine was a mere 16 when she married the nearly 50-year-old Henry in 1540, four years after Anne's death. If you're thinking that age gap doesn't sound like a basis for a successful marriage, you are even more right than you thought. Barely a year was out before Catherine was discovered having an affair with a younger, hotter, and altogether less rotund man. So it was a quick arrest, a short trip to the tower, and then another thunk of the axe, and goodbye wife number five. It is said that before she was decapitated, she asked for the block that she'd have her head chopped off on brought to her cell so that she could practice kneeling before it. When the executioner finally cut off her head, he made her kneel in the exact same place Catherine's cousin, Anne Boleyn, had knelt to be beheaded all those years before. Henry VIII himself died six years later in 1547. By that time, he had remarried yet another woman called Catherine. She happily avoided the fate of her predecessor. Yet the tower's use as a prison, it outlasted Henry's death. Not long after Henry died, Lady Jane Grey, the Nine Days Queen, was chucked into a cell by her aunt, Queen Mary, who wanted the throne to herself. Since Mary's nickname is Bloody Mary, you can probably guess what happened to Lady Jane. Yes, another thunk of the axe followed by the thud of a head rolling into a basket. Another famous inmate of the Tower of London was Guy Fawkes, the guy who tried to blow up Parliament. Guy Fawkes was one of the few prisoners to ever escape the tower's fate for them. Not in the sense that he scaled the wall and ran away, but in the sense that as he was being led to the scaffold for execution, he managed to leap over the side and break his neck, dying instantly. Even in death, we like to imagine he was grinning from ear to ear. But there was one other set of prisoners at the tower who wouldn't be remembered by history, who wouldn't even be regarded as prisoners by their jailers. It's time for us to finally meet the animals of the Tower of London. Okay, so we need to wind the clock back now. Back across the centuries, back across Henry VIII's six wives, back across all those death
damn guys called Edward all the way back to the reign of King John. Remember John? He was the brother of Richard the Lionheart, the one who stormed the tower while his brother was out crusading, only to be dragged out of the tower at sword point when Richard returned. Well, when Richard died in 1199, John became king, a job that he really sucked at. Seriously, if John was trying to get hired at Walmart today, he'd leave King off his resume because he was so bad at it. In the early part of his reign, John lost a whole lot of the Norman lands that England had been united with since William had done his conquering. The only consolation was that John actually got a consolation prize for real. In 1204, just after it lost Normandy, John received three crates. Inside them was a collection of exotic beasts from across the world, including lions and bears. So, well, what did John do with these unwanted zoo animals? Well, he did the same thing that Henry VIII did with his unwanted wives. He locked them up in the Tower of London. The Tower of London Menagerie would outlast John's crummy reign not just by six years or six decades, but rather by six centuries. From this inauspicious start, it grew to be one of the largest collections of unusual animals in the whole of Europe. John's successor, Henry III, was particularly adept at adding to the Menagerie. In 1252, he convinced the King of Norway to gift him a polar bear for the tower. Just three years later, in 1255, he added the first elephant on British soil since the days of the Romans. For those able to see the Menagerie, and we keep using that term because zoo didn't really come into fashion until the 19th century, it must have been as awe-inspiring as it would be for us to see a live T-Rex being ridden by a shirtless Jeff Goldblum. But the actual numbers allowed to witness the animals could be counted on the palm of one hand. Menageries in Europe they weren't for the public, or for science, or for private entertainment. They were for showing off. It's sort of like, the King of France has a bear, does he? Well, then we shall get a polar bear. But maybe that was for the best. Much as we hate to ruin this light-hearted segment, the truth is that the animals in the Tower of London suffered atrociously. Take the lions, for example. While the three lions are a symbol of England, somewhat confusingly, as that's three more lions than we've ever had living in the wild, the lions at the Tower they were chained up and kept in a tiny, cramped space known as the Lion Tower. When James I assumed the throne, he even instituted regular fights between the lions and dogs for his own amusement. Still, the lions had it better than London's stray cats. Legend has it that commoners were sometimes allowed in to see the beasts if they brought a cat for the lions to eat. By the 18th century, the Menagerie played host to rhinos, baboons, ocelots, wolves, tigers, hyenas, and others too numerous to mention. But while tales persist right into the 19th century of people doing crazy stuff like trying to get the elephants drunk on wine, the Tower of London's petting zoo couldn't last forever. Starting in 1831, the animals were slowly removed and placed in the slightly saner environment of the newly opened London Zoo. By the end of that decade, there were no animals left in the tower. A tradition stretching all the way back to the 13th century had finally come to an end. The story of the tower itself, though, it still had one final act. By the time the 20th century dawned, the Tower of London had lost almost all of its historic functions. The royal family no longer lived there. The animals were gone. The royal mint had been moved. There wasn't even a tower left for the king's wardrobe, for goodness sakes. But it still retained one traditional function. The tower was still a place where ne'er-do-wells could be locked up and executed. However, the nature of those locked up had now changed. Gone were the days of John Balliol, the Scottish king, who'd been allowed to keep both his wife and dozens of hunting dogs in his cell with him. Now the Tower of London was reserved for traitors to the crown. During World War I, this meant spies for the Central Powers. Between 1914 and 1918, it was common for those convicted of espionage to be dragged there, lined up against a wall, and shot. It was a practice that continued all the way into World War II, well, partway at least. On August 15, 1941, with the tower still damaged by bombing sustained in the Blitz, a 43-year-old meteorologist from Luxembourg was taken out to the courtyard and placed before a firing squad. Convicted of spying for the Nazis, Joseph Jacobs had no way of knowing that he was about to make history. As the guard asked if he had any last words, Jacob looked each member of the firing squad right in the eye and told them, shoot straight. Seconds later, there were the cracks of rifles, several puffs of smoke, and then Joseph Jacobs was dead, the last person to ever be executed at the Tower of London. Not long after, the tower finally ceased to function as a prison. From the moment old Ranulf Flambard had stepped into his cell way, way back in 1100 AD, the tower had been a place for the miscreants of society. The same summer that Joseph Jacobs was executed, it had played host to perhaps its biggest miscreant of all. 
High-ranking Nazi Rudolf Hess had been briefly held there after landing his plane in Scotland on a secret peace mission. He would go on to be convicted in the Nuremberg trials. But at the close of World War II and with the beginning of a long era of peace in Europe, London finally lost the need for such a symbolic prison. The last people to be held in the Tower of London were the Cray Twins, a pair of gangsters perhaps as famous for their celebrity connections as for their crimes. In 1952, they were briefly held for dodging national service. When they walked out, the days of history's most infamous prison, they came to an end. Today, the Tower of London is a mere tourist site, another place for visitors to tick off alongside Buckingham Palace and the London Eye. But even defanged and robbed of its purposes, the tower still carries the traces of its tortured past. Many still talk of the ghosts that haunt the tower. While it seems unlikely that the souls of dead queens and princes are literally wandering around, the stories of their gruesome fates still linger, haunting our collective memory. It may have lost its palpable sense of menace, but the Tower of London is still a place where murders, assassinations, cruelty, and madness once bloomed. It seems likely that we'll still be talking about it after another thousand years. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. And don't forget to subscribe. When you're subscribing, hit the bell icon. Also, I've got another channel. It's called Today I Found Out. If you enjoy this content from me, why not check out that channel as well? It is linked to below. And as always, thank you for watching.